For 20 years, the CIA spent vast sums of money in an effort to, as they put it officially, to denigrate and obstruct the People's Republic of China, to undermine the communist regime in Beijing. And they're dropping leaflets over mainland China. They're dropping agents over mainland China, most of whom would die. You know, they're, they're spreading fake news in Hong Kong. They're broadcasting anti-China messages from South Korean radio stations. They're working with Chiang Kai-shek in Taiwan. And many in the CIA, at least some, saw in the Tibetans' struggle for independence, perhaps a convenient proxy war in which to carry out their own mission. Over the course of the decade, and with the initial approval of President Dwight Eisenhower, the CIA spent tens of millions of dollars arming, training, and supporting hundreds of Tibetan guerrilla fighters. These are independence movement fighters. Uh, the CIA dropped tons of weaponry and supplies and ammunition and whatnot to these guys in Tibet. See, after the communists defeated the nationalists in the Chinese Civil War, Mao turned to Tibet. And though the Tibetans put up a noble defense, in the end they were no match for the seasoned People's Liberation Army, the word liberation. Mao foisted on the Tibetans in the end a sham agreement for the liberation of Tibet and the PLA rolled into Lhasa. Meanwhile, in the countryside, resistance still remained strong, resistance against the Chinese, particularly that led by a guy named Gompo Tashi Andruktsang, the leader of the Chushi Gangdruk. Now the Chushi Gangdruk fought valiantly and, if reports are to be believed, remarkably successfully, especially given the fact that these weren't real soldiers, these weren't trained soldiers, you know, these are farmers. And they're up against, as I said, veteran PLA and seemingly numberless PLA. So how are they supposed to fare in the end against that? Well, that's where the CIA came in. See, the CIA had previously approached the Dalai Lama's older brother, and now he reactivated that relationship. And before long, you've got half a dozen Chushi Gangdruk members whisked away on a plane, something, of course, they'd never even really seen before. They're taken to the island of Saipan, where they're trained in modern weaponry. They're trained in codes and espionage and guerrilla tactics, and crucially, in the use of a ham radio transmitter. Soon, CIA-trained Tibetan guerrilla fighters were being parachuted into Tibet from American planes. And it wasn't long after that that the Americans began dropping the weaponry, too. And of course, all the while, you've got a couple CIA-trained ham radio operators keeping the CIA abreast of happenings in Tibet, including the reorganization of the Chushi Gangdruk into a more broadly based, you know, resistance movement. Now, this was all very romantic to the CIA officers involved, you know, getting messages from faraway exotic Tibet. But for the Tibetans in the fight, obviously this was life or death. And not just life or death for them, but life or death for their country, for their religion, for their culture, for their language. But CIA assistance didn't stop with training a handful of Chushi Gantruk members and dropping a ham radio and some weapons. No, in fact, the CIA prepared an entire training camp, what the Chinese would have considered a terrorist training camp, ironically, but what the CIA considered a freedom fighter training camp for the Tibetans at Camp Hale. It was called Camp Hale in Colorado. So the Tibetans could be reminded of home by the Rocky Mountains. And here they flew many guerrilla fighters to be trained, or at least future guerrilla fighters, to be trained, again, in weaponry and, and guerrilla tactics and codes and espionage and uh, you know, operation of radios and the whole nine yards. The whole time, the Tibetans assumed that the Americans were really in it to help free Tibet. I mean, they, they thought that, you know, Ike Eisenhower, whose picture hung there at Camp Hale smiling down upon them, was really in it for them. In fact, by at least one account, some of the CIA officers themselves began to be convinced that maybe America was actually in this to free Tibet. All this time, of course, the Chinese government is militarily occupying Tibet. Okay, they've committed atrocities in Tibet, especially in eastern Tibet. There's refugees flooding into Lhasa throughout this, this decade, the near decade, but throughout this period, the Chinese government is able to maintain a sort of shaky facade of cooperation between the Dalai Lama's government in Lhasa and itself. But when it became apparent, or at least word spread, that the Chinese were planning 
to get rid of the Dalai Lama, to assassinate the Dalai Lama. Uh, there was an uprising in Lhasa, and in the event, in the middle of this chaotic event, somehow, uh, miraculously, the Dalai Lama was able to escape from Lhasa, escape from the Potala and from Lhasa, whisked away by some of these guerrillas and, and traveling through guerrilla-held territory. And we know that at least a couple of the guerrillas that personally accompanied him the whole way to the Indian border were these CIA-trained guerrillas from Camp Hale. Well, this changed everything. The facade shattered. You know, Mao now had no reason to hold anything back. The Tibetans thought it was bad before. Now that the Dalai Lama had left, it got far, far worse. China's repression of Tibet had really only just begun and begun with a vengeance. The armed resistance discovered that the Chinese could send almost inexhaustible numbers of troops and military units far away to Tibet. And they were hounded and they were killed like never before. At one point, the Chinese discovered the armed resistance main base and actually hit it, killing thousands, including many women and children, and including almost all of the CIA trained fighters. This single event effectively spelled the end of any meaningful armed resistance. Now, most of the CIA trained fighters that were dropped into Tibet ended up dead or refugees or as torture victims in Chinese prisons. Of course, they knew that that was a possibility going in. By the way, this is, this is pretty much the record of the CIA elsewhere in Asia when they trained and tried to drop in fighters. They mostly ended up dead. Meanwhile, Tibetan armed resistance moved to Nepal, to Mustang, where cross-border raids were the order of the day. Now, Eisenhower, toward the end of his presidency, in the wake of the embarrassing U-2 spy plane incident, scaled back American support for the Tibetan cause. But when JFK took office, he resumed support for a while. And there was, you know, there were a few little successes, cross-border raid successes, captured documents that led to some pretty important intel the Tibetans were able to hand off to the Americans. But it was all in vain as the Chinese set up to stay. Military bases, police force, roads, airstrips, you name it. These invaders were here to stay, and they're still here. And there's still lots of bases and lots of police and heavy military presence, uh, almost a stifling military presence during certain times of the year. Uh, security checkpoints, police posts everywhere, especially in uh, Old Town, the Barkor area of Lhasa. Uh, propaganda machine churning out material all the time. So definitely, definitely here to stay. Uh, with the foreign policy of Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger, with you know, the United States rapprochement with China, I mean, that was it. That was it. The U.S., of course, couldn't continue to support armed resistance uh, in the name of Tibetan independence, obviously. When the Tibetan armed resistance was forced to shut down its operations in Nepal, by Nepal, by Nepalese forces, many of the freedom fighters committed suicide. We know that at least one CIA-trained fighter cut his own throat. Another CIA-trained fighter, refusing to die like that, charged Nepalese forces and died at their hands. Now, for the CIA, the whole operation had been about, you know, fighting communism, really about, you know, denigrating and being a nuisance to the People's Republic of China, uh, and gaining intelligence and whatnot. For the Tibetans, the fight had been about regaining the independence of their country. And in the end, these two goals turned out to be incompatible. And the failure of Tibetan armed resistance was added to the agency's long list of interventionist failures.